Conventional science recognizes that all matter, each molecule of everything on Earth and beyond, oscillates at its own distinct frequency. Can the amplified voice of Ella Fitzgerald shatter this glass? The atoms that come together to form a molecule are held together with an energy bond that both emits and absorbs its own specific electromagnetic frequency. No two species of molecules have the same electromagnetic oscillations or energetic signature. By increasing the intensity of the harmonic frequency of the molecular structure of the wine glass, science can cause the glass to shatter. Believe it. This is a commonly accepted law of nature. So why can't other molecules be isolated and destroyed in the same way? Why can't the oscillation frequencies of killer viruses like cancer and AIDS be identified and destroyed? Why hasn't someone performed the research? Well, someone has. Royal Raymond Reif was a brilliant scientist who was born in 1888 and died in 1971. His studies at Johns Hopkins University led to his development of the technologies that are still commonly used today in the fields of optics, electronics, radiochemistry, biochemistry, ballistics, and aviation. He received 14 major awards and honors, including an honorary doctorate from the University of Heidelberg. During the 30 years that Reif spent designing and building medical instruments, he worked for Zeiss Optics, the U.S. government, and several private benefactors. Because Reif was self-educated in so many different fields, he intuitively looked for his answers in areas beyond the rigid scientific structure of his day. He had mastered so many different disciplines that he literally had at his intellectual disposal the skills and knowledge of an entire team of scientists and technicians from a number of different scientific fields. So whenever new technology was needed to perform a new task, Reif simply invented and then built it himself. In 1920, Reif began investigating the possibilities of treating disease with electricity. He discovered that each disease he studied had different electrical characteristics and started subjecting these organisms to different electrical frequencies. His first virus microscope complete, Reif performed tens of thousands of lab tests in an effort to isolate the microorganism that caused tuberculosis. Traditional scientific procedure requires the staining of samples to make them visible under the microscope. Unfortunately, the minuteness of the viruses made them impossible to stain with the existing acid-based stains. Reif conceived a method of staining the samples with light and began building a microscope that would enable the frequency of light to correspond with the electrical frequency of the microorganism under observation. His cancer research began in 1922, but it would take until 1932 after thousands of tests that he was able to isolate the microorganism which he named the BX virus. By 1933, he had perfected that technology and had constructed the incredibly complex universal microscope, which is capable of magnifying objects 60,000 times their normal size. With this incredible microscope, Reif became the first human being to actually see a live virus. Until quite recently, the universal microscope was the only microscope able to view a live virus. Reif painstakingly identified the individual spectroscopic signature of each microbe. Colleagues of Reif reported his incredible patience, sitting at the microscope many times for over 24 hours straight without a break. Once he discovered the oscillation rate of a particular organism, Reif concentrated on refining his method of destroying it. He used the same principle to kill the virus as he had used to make the organism visible, light frequency resonance. By increasing the intensity of a frequency that resonated naturally within these microbes, Reif increased their natural oscillations until they distorted and disintegrated from structural stresses without harming the surrounding tissue. Reif called this frequency the mortal oscillatory rate, or MOR. Half a century later, doctors began using a like technology known as lithotripsy, where kidney stones are destroyed with high-energy shock waves. 
Identify the MOR of cancer cells. Turn up the volume and destroy them without damaging the host organism. It sounds like a scientific miracle, but will it work on the human body? In 1934, a clinical study was set up at the Scripps uh, Annex. Now this is the Scripps Ranch. It was owned by Ellen Scripp. And uh, there they set up a clinical study under the auspices of Dr. Milbank Johnson. And they had a team of physicians that examined terminal cancer patients. Every one of those patients was declared terminal by their uh, group of scientists that was involved in this study. Dr. Reif would take some of the blood, examine, find the particular frequency for that organism for that patient, tune that instrument to the patient. Within two months, 14 of the 16 patients were declared cured by this team of physicians. It took another six weeks to cure the remaining two. 100% cure rate. Unfortunately, this all happened in 1934, and the participants of that study are long gone. So there isn't anyone around that can give a first-hand account of the success of RIPE's technology. Or is there? In May 2002, uh, a lump appeared on my chest, and it just came up overnight. It wasn't sore. I had not been feeling bad, a little tired. And uh, anyway, I went straight away to the doctor and they ran tests. They didn't seem too concerned about it. They ran tests, called me the same afternoon and told me it was very bad. And it was stage four cancer. And I had 90 days to live. Through the problem of being put on dialysis at the same time and my feet were so swollen and legs were so swollen until I wasn't even able to wear shoes. I even developed varicose veins in my legs. I was diagnosed with cancer nine years ago. I've had two operations and this third time I was diagnosed in January and was only given to me to live. Well, I, I couldn't sleep in the bed, I had to sleep on the couch because I could lean up against the couch, you know, the back of it. My wife fed me laying down, and I think I look like a spider going across the floor, I'd lost so much weight. I have pulmonary fibrosis. I was told in April of 2002 to get my affairs in order that I was going to die. One night, my my throat started bleeding right on the tonsil and I uh, went into the emergency room and the doctor looked at it and said, well, that looks like a, a tumor to me. And I wasn't used to looking in the back of my throat, so I hadn't been looking back there. And uh, anyway, he biopsied it and it was uh, cancer. I got roofing touring off of It's uh, It's a cripple disease and it can make you cripple after you get older. Well, older people got it, but I'm young. But the doctor told me when I get older, I will be crippled and stuff. I had pneumonia five times in two years. It required two sinus surgeries, one uh, hernia surgery, uh, tubes in my ears twice. Four foot of metal rods in my back, four foot of wire, four hooks, four screws, and a bone graft. I tore the spinal cord into a T11. Uh, by the time I would get home in the evening, I would be hurting so bad, the only thing I could do was lay on my stomach and rub my hip. You have to deal with complete fatigue and when when I talk about complete fatigue I, I mean you are as tired as you could possibly imagine being being tired and it does not go away. In my right hand I had arthritis real bad and I'm a hairdresser and um, that interfered with my work. And I came and became involved to save my best friend from cancer. Uh, fortunately for him, I happened to have made a lot of money during my photography career and when he got sick, went through everything that he had uh, to go through with orthodox medicine, sent him on to die. Um, we began looking for different things. He worked with California and Western Medicine. Beam Ray President Lynn Kenny rediscovered the Rife technology in 1986 when a close friend was diagnosed with cancer and given only six months to a year to live. While his doctors gave him little hope of survival, Lynn never wavered in his pursuit of a cure. 
His research into nutrition and alternative treatments led to his discovery of Dr. Reif and his work. Then uh, we stumbled across at a conference uh, uh, Reif's work and a, a book about Reif. I'd found a, on a bookend table a single sheet of paper that had a little story about uh, Lakovsky and his multiple wave oscillator. We had uh, Tesla and what he had done, his contributions to society. Third paragraph was about Dr. Royal Reif, the microscopes he invented and, and the beam ray device that he had used to destroy infectious organisms, viruses, bacteria, fungus in the body. And as I read that, I thought, man, this is the answer, if it's true. So from that point, I just dove into trying to find things on Rife, and I couldn't really find anything. He wasn't in the medical books, and there just wasn't anything to be found. And then within about three months, a book came out called The Cancer Cure That Worked, 50 Years of Suppression. And I got that, went through those references, went and looked up everything that was in there, learned how to do research, found newspaper articles, medical articles, science articles on Dr. Royal Rife and his work. So I've been able to obtain uh, the estate of uh, one of the gentlemen who worked with Rife for over 22 years. Uh, he has original beam tubes, uh, one of the original working machines, who's helped us tremendously. Uh, we paid a huge amount of money to obtain a lot of Rife's original uh, lab notes, film footage and everything. We own the original uh, 16 millimeter film to Rife's lab. Uh, we were able to look at the waveform patterns that he used, recreate, add more harmonics, better ringing effect, quicker rise and fall times, things that make this work. And my best friend was the guinea pig for it because he had nothing to lose. Inspired by the incredible success of the beam ray technology, Lynn founded the Beam Ray Corporation to help others learn about Dr. Rife and his incredible healing technology. For the past 16 years, uh, as we've been developing this technology, we've gotten into a major Midwest hospital. Uh, we've been able to obtain an IRB that allows us to uh, work with human patients in the study for pain relief, pain management. We've done uh, several in vitro studies. Uh, we are currently involved with a major university who for the past two years uh, has been studying uh, the effects of this on the known cancer cell lines in vitro studies. Uh, we've picked up a lot of information there. So we have some medical doctors who are currently using our equipment to see the effects of what it will do for pain relief. And in, in doing these studies we have found that not only is it great for pain relief, but it's great at relieving uh, the symptoms of a lot of other things. Uh, parasites for one thing, virus, fungus, bacteria. In cancer, we have seen cancer tumors disappear. We have the, the medical doctors coming to us and saying, I know that my clients are sitting under this light for pain relief and pain management, but we've also noticed that their tumors are shrinking or completely going away. Uh, and we've collected that medical data and eventually we hope to present that to the FDA also. But right now our current thing is to help people who do not have a choice, who have exhausted all of their uh, uh, options with uh, orthodox medicine, chemo, radiation, surgery, or whatever may be offered in an experimental program. Generally we're their last hope. And generally by the time they get to us, they're in extreme pain or some type of pain on heavy morphine and stuff. And we offer them an opportunity to at least try something that's non-invasive, non-toxic, very little to no side effects to alleviate this pain. And, and it's free of charge to them. The way that I heard about the light of a counseling on aging was bringing me from Lake Charles for a visit. And I had just gone to a, a community concern meeting, and she asked, did we hear about the light? And I thought maybe we were getting a new light here in town, you know, and she said, no, the light at Kathy's house. When I started coming here, my feet were swelling. And I knew, I knew from my feet swelling, it either had to be my heart or the kidney. I kept telling the doctor, I don't want to go on dialysis. Do you hear me? I don't want to go. And I told him, I said, I'm not going. Do you hear me? 
And all of the readings were leading up to dialysis, you know, and one doctor told me he was going to let me get worse, you know, so I switched and went to another doctor. I was taking the medicine that the doctor prescribed and I wasn't getting any better and I was having the blood work done and the creatinine wasn't going down, you know. And uh, so when the doctor told me I had to get, I was still coming when he was telling me, you know, you need to be on it, you know, and I kept saying, I don't want to go. And I said, the Lord, know that I don't want And he told me, he said, well, that's going to be the only thing the Lord is going to, I said, well, I'm not going on dialysis. And I just started coming and, and really staying on the alpha alpha tablets. I knew I was getting better the second time when I went to see him because I had been having to go every week and then he put it off to two months and I knew I was getting better then. But now I'm able to wear shoes and I wasn't able to wear shoes. Well, uh, I had a miracle happen, I think. Uh, I was uh, down in my back. Had been for, from September to uh, 2002 until the 14th of February this year. Lost 35 pounds. Uh, I, I, I went to uh, doctors, back doctors, I went, well, bone doctors, and I found out he didn't do backs. And uh, I got an MRI down at Lake Charles, and uh, they couldn't find any uh, indication of a pinched nerve. And went to chiropractors, and shoot, nothing was done to do it. I finally went to the hospital and I got a shot in the back. And that helped a little bit, but not much. Uh, I couldn't sleep in the bed, I had to sleep on the couch, because I could lean up against the couch, you know, the back of it. My wife fed me laying down, and I think I looked like a spider going across the floor, I'd lost so much weight. I went from 180 to about a uh, 145, something like that. I came here and I sat under that light for one hour and a half. And when I got up, I didn't have any back problem. Uh, when I sat down in the chair and I was sitting there and I looked at the light and I felt like a fool. But when I got up, I didn't. After all that time, hurting, I mean bad too. But uh, after an hour and a half, when I got up, man, I didn't feel like a fool sitting there anymore. I've been coming back ever since. Right my head to this. Uh, my, I, had, I was diagnosed with cancer nine years ago. I've had two operations, and the third time I was diagnosed in January, and was only given to me to live. I had had 72 treatments of radiation, and uh, I have part of my tongue is part of my leg, and I had no survivor's glands. Uh, when I first come to Texas, I could not, nobody could understand me, and now people can kind of understand me. I didn't always talk this way. I've known Cassie ever since she was a little girl. And I had heard how bad off she was. And they said, Marion, you need to go to the right. Well, I thought they was crazy. And after they said that the third time they couldn't do nothing for me, I had seven phone calls saying, Marion, go to the right. So I said, well, I guess I'll go to the light. When I got to Cassie's, this side of my mouth was drooping. It was, and, and I couldn't turn my head, and I can turn my head now. And all this part of my face here was numb, and it's not numb no more. Uh, and I'm doing much better. I don't take hardly any medication anymore. So this has prolonged my life in a good way. 
I can talk to my children and, and piss on as a body. <laughs> yeah. Had severe pain in my left hip for three and a half years. Yeah, about three and a half years when I started coming. I had been to neurologist, neurosurgeon, orthopedic surgeon. I have had months and months of physical therapy, had um, taken tons of pain pills, uh, had uh, selective nerve blocks. By the time I would get home in the evening, I would be hurting so bad, the only thing I could do was lay on my stomach and rub my hip. I would rub my hip until I literally had a bruise the size of a grapefruit on my, my cheek of my butt. <laughs> and uh, so I heard about this light and that it would help. Within two days of coming here, I had no more hip pain. Uh, I was ecstatic. I just could not believe that I had no more hip pain. I also got rid of the large liver spots I had that covered both my cheeks, had these big brown spots. They have basically gone away. I was, all of this was covered with um, like little mole skin tag wart things. They all fell off. Yeah, my skin got softer. Uh, my wrinkles are better. I have a big scar on my calf that I've had since I was 18 and it has almost gone away. Um, I had uh, surgery on my left leg which entailed a hundred, I had about a hundred incisions and all of those scars are gone. My husband, if I don't come, he tells me, you have to go back to the light. So I do because he knows if I stay away then I hurt. And if I come here, I don't hurt. Don't hurt. Uh, one night my, my throat started bleeding right on the tonsil and I uh, went into the emergency room and the doc looked at it and said, well that looks like a, a tumor to me and I wasn't used to looking in the back of my throat so I hadn't been looking back there and uh, anyway he biopsied it and it was uh, cancer. They ran me through their treatment, you know, the whole process of working you up. Okay, well Mr. Smith, yeah, we, you know, you've got this uh, a tumor on, on your tonsil here and uh, we're going to give you radiation. And first they, you know, they have to uh, pull teeth if they shoot radiation, anything that's been in the, in the radiated field. Unfortunately, we'll never heal properly because the capillaries are, are burned from radiation. But then they set you in a room and say, well, you know, you, uh, after radiation, you know, you're going to have extreme dry mouth like for the rest of your life. It, it pretty well kills your saliva glands. Uh, and you can't eat. A lot of people have to have a, a feeding tube put in when they've had their throat uh, radiated. It's, it's, a, it's a horrible, uh, barbaric process. Super bad burn, you know, that actually never really heals down to the cellular level. And I knew I didn't want to do that, so we said, okay. And, uh, and left, and so uh, glad we left. <laughs> uh, Forrest Hawkins came up to me and says, well, uh, I hear you got a problem with your in your throat. And I told him, yeah, I got cancer. And he said, well, I'm, I can't tell you anything right now, but I'm going next weekend to uh, a, a seminar about uh, this kind of new kind of treatment. And I said, uh, what is it, you know? And I named off several different things, you know, hyperbarics or, or, or what is it? And he said, well, I can, I, I can tell you this, it uses radio frequency. I said, well, that sounds good. You know, I know that's really powerful stuff. So I'm doing great. I'm doing great. That's been uh, almost a year ago. And uh, I'm doing great, man. I was told in April of 2002 to get my affairs in order that I was going to die. Uh, he just didn't know when. I have pulmonary fibrosis. Uh, in addition to that, I have a disease uh, called neurofibromatosis. It's a genetic disorder. Uh, all my life I've done nothing but get worse and worse. These tumors, there's no cure except maybe surgery. In November, I was in bed and I rolled over in bed and was in excruciating pain all of a sudden and called the ambulance and uh, had to have nitrolingual on the way because my blood pressure was so high. I had to have an MRI and uh, also an angiogram. A plexiform tumor had formed on three of my ribs and broke my ribs and I was in pain and I was taking pain medication uh, and the pain medication wasn't working. When I was told to get my affairs in order then 
we were uh, looking at trying to see about a lung transplant and I, I waffled back and forth trying to decide what to do and finally I decided I wanted to live so I went and to New Orleans to see about a lung transplant, but of course I was turned down. But when we had the lung function test, after he got through telling me this, we did a lung function test, I had a 33% jump on one of my tests and a 15% on another. Now I've been on steroids for three years and I've never had this kind of jump. You know, again, like I'm saying, in October I was looking at, at a lung surgery, or a lung transplant, should I say. And uh, so I've been nothing but getting better. A lot of people see, can see that my skin is getting smoother and stuff. And so it's, you know, but when you have 10,000 10, tumors, it's kind of hard to see for yourself. But I know that I'm breathing better. Instead of four liters of oxygen, uh, I'm on three liters now. And at night, I can sleep with uh, two and a half instead of three liters. And so that's, you know, my breathing's better. Well, in 97, I was a police officer working for the Vernon Parish Sheriff's Department. And I was chasing a subject with a canine dog. And I fell, and at momentary, I was paralyzed after the fall from the waist down. And then I initially went on to the hospital where they'd done tests and more tests and more tests. I wound up in New Orleans. And they'd done a surgery to my spine where they put four foot of metal rods in my back, four foot of wire, four hooks, four screws, and a bone graft. I tore the spinal cord into a T11. And the pain was so bad when I come to that it was bad. You know, I just couldn't hardly stand it. So I hurt with a, probably a year and a half later, and I wound up in Houston, Texas in the hospital. And they done more tests on me where They'd found all the rods had come loose, the screws had come loose, infection had set up, so I was forced to go through another surgery. After that surgery, the pain was still there. And more pain tablets, pills, that's all I lived on. I didn't have a life. I just sat. I thought about suicide several times, which I thank God Almighty that I didn't do it. So my mother-in-law, knew Kathy with a beam ray light and she kept insisting me coming to DeRitter to sit on the beam ray light. I told her, I said, there's no way a light can help me. I said, if it could, I turned on a light switch. I said, if that light could help me, this would help me. So I finally gave in to her and I came to Kathy's. The house was full of people and I was sitting there and I sat as far as away as I could because I didn't think nothing would work. Doctors hadn't worked, pills hadn't worked, morphine hadn't worked, and I just kept coming and kept coming, and thank God I did. I didn't see nothing until the seventh trip I came, and then when I woke up the next morning out of the recliner where I slept, I didn't have no pain, and I just kept coming. Eventually I got off the pills, and they had me on a patch like cancer patient was. So I wore them to about three weeks ago and I'm totally off of them at this point. I was at the point that I, I just wanted to give up and quit. And uh, like I say, here I am now, I drive. I do just about anything. I'm not well by no means. I still have my problems, but at least I got a life. October of, of 2000, I was diagnosed with late stage Lyme disease. The doctor I was seeing put me on some, some antibiotics. Um, I started out on amoxicillin, which, which is just, just an oral um, medicine. And I, I was on that for, for, for several months and then it, it quit working. So I had to go as far as to start um, daily IV treatments. Um, and that's, that's how, uh, how uh, how I've been treating my, my illness now for about eight months. When it first attacks you, um, you have to deal with complete fatigue. And when, when I talk about complete fatigue, I, I mean you are as tired as you could possibly imagine being, being tired. 
and it does not go away. No amount of sleep helps. In fact, it does not allow you to sleep at times. After it gives you the, the fatigue, you go on to have to deal with a bunch of joint pain. It attacks your, your joints and it gives you what is called Lyme arthritis. It's essentially the same as, as rheumatoid arthritis or very similar. It hurts just as bad. Um, after it attacks the, the joints, it goes on to, to attack and eat away at, at the nervous system of the body and winds up killing the nerves, which gives you neuropathy. Um, at that point, it, it works its way towards the spine, works its way up the spine, and it enters the brain. At the point that it enters the brain, you're at stage three. If it is not caught in the brain, um, it can go on to attack and shut down all the vital organs, which essentially is your, your demise with, with this if, if you're not treated. Um, they, they caught mine in the brain, so I do not have any organ damage uh, as far as my heart, my liver, or, or, or my kidneys. Two weeks ago, uh, some, some very close uh, friends of the family bought one of the beam ray lights for, for an illness of, of their own and thought about me and thought that the light might help me with, with, with my illness. 15 minutes into my IV treatment, there's a definite stinging itch feeling that I have, I have to, to deal with. What, what that is, it's, it's the medicine attacking the, the, the Lyme bacteria. And 15 minutes after sitting under the beam ray light, I had the exact same sensation. So I, I continued to sit for, for an hour and a half under the light and uh, after the treatment was over, I stood up out of the chair that I, was, I, was, I, had, I had been sitting in, and for the first time in two and a half years, I walked away pain free. Pain free. Since I've been taking the light treatments, a lot of the numbness in my hands and in my feet and in other parts of the body are coming back already. Um, it's, it, it's amazing to me. <laughs> I was diagnosed with stage four lung cancer that had metastasized to around my heart, uh, in my lymph nodes, trachea, and it was compressing my heart and my superior vena cava. And uh, it was life-threatening. I only had a matter of days to live. They offered me the standard treatment, uh, a clinical trial, and extensive radiation therapy and it would not save my life. It would supposedly extend my life and improve my quality of life. Anyone that's ever had chemo and radiation uh, that I have talked to will never say that it improved their quality of life. So my answer was no, no, no. <laughs> After I came home from a week of extensive testing and was told that uh, there was no hope for me, that perhaps my life could be extended to six or seven months, uh, I was at a loss of what to do. I knew what I wasn't going to do, but I didn't know what I was going to do. Uh, my children, some of my grown children, did some extensive research. I wasn't in much shape to do it, and so I flew out to San Diego went to an alternative cancer clinic in Tijuana, Mexico, and spent a month out there. And it was while I was out there that I heard the mumblings about the beam ray. And uh, when you see as many people talking about it as I did, well then you know there's bound to be something to it. Uh, so that's when I began investigating. And I was going to try anything. Anybody that's been told that they're dying will try anything. My husband was absolutely, totally, adamantly against it. He said it was nothing but a glorified flashlight. 
Uh, he might as well burn the money in the fireplace. He was very aggravated because you have to understand, we had probably spent forty or fifty thousand dollars on gadgets and machines, and he was very. And we didn't have the money to begin with. He exhausted our savings. We're not wealthy people, and uh, we had spent years working, the both of us, and put children through college and all. And we just exhausted in a matter of three months. Our money was gone, our savings and everything. And I, I came up with this, you know, a lot. He said, you know, it, it's not going to work. But I tried everything. I was even going to sell my jewelry and what little we had left to buy one. And uh, finally, I couldn't gather up enough money. Wayne. And so what I did was, uh, uh, I was upset. It wasn't faking. I told him he didn't love me. Because when you're dying, I said, if it was you or one of the children, I would rob a bank, you know, to get what you thought helped you. And in my mind, it was helping me. And uh, I had no doubt it was helping me, but he was skeptical about it. He thought it was the nutritionals and, and much of what I did in Mexico, which did get me back on my feet. But the, the beam ray was the icing on the cake. It was just the icing on the cake. I, I just can't say enough about it. I was sitting in this chair with this light blinking over two, about two and a half feet over my head and thinking, woman, you must be nuts. You're dying. The doctors say you're literally a few weeks away from death, and you're sitting in a chair with a light blinking over your head. It's very funny. But the more I did it, the better I felt. And uh, I think that's a good indication as to how you're progressing. Because if you feel wonderful and you have no pain and you have energy and you're sleeping well and your appetite increases and and, and you're just a normal person. Well, something's happening. This happened in May when I found out. And I just was going downhill and getting thin and just people were praying. And all of a sudden, I come back in October and I'm running around, you know, wonderful, feeling great and at the grocery store and driving. And people say, Ken, my Lord, what did you do? You know, and I tell them a little something. And, and they, were, they were flabbergasted. And it wasn't long before the phone went to ringing. I have a friend, or I have, do you think it'll help? Try it. I know what it did for me, try it. And of course, when you've been blessed like I'm blessed, and my family has been blessed, how can you tell another person no? So what started out as two people was soon four, and from four to eight, and from, <laughs> from last October through now, we probably have 100 or 200 people a day that visit our home. So we never, we never announced it, we never invited anyone. We just wanted other people to be blessed like we've been blessed. In 1931, Reif's work was celebrated at a dinner with 44 of the nation's most respected medical authorities. The banquet was billed as the end to all diseases. His work was also the subject of studies performed by the Mayo Clinic, the University of Southern California, the Smithsonian Institute, the Christian Science Monitor, and dozens of newspapers and magazine articles. His tireless dedication to the eradication of disease has led to the end of pain and suffering to thousands of people who credit his work for saving their lives. But the question remains, could Wright's miraculous technology really have been lost to the medical community for these long years? And much more importantly, what will Wright's beam ray do for you? Tell them, shoot, try it. It don't hurt you, just try it. And it'll work. Why would it hurt you to go see it and, and try it? Because if I wasn't if with this light, I would be dead now because it only gave me to me to live. Most people are going to find a benefit out of this. If you follow the program and do everything that you're supposed to do, you know, you're going to get better. Then the first thing popped in my mind, Jesus is the light of the world, you know, and I said, I'm going. I would tell them to just uh, explore the beam ray for sure. It's not going to cost anything to find out about it. and it's. Uh, it's a wonderful alternative to chemotherapy and radiation. It works. <laughs> it works. It, it has given me my, my life back. I just, um, 
I don't have to get up and, and worry about how bad I'm going to feel or how hard I'm going to have to push myself through the day. I just get up and I go about my business and I have a very normal sense of life now, which I did not have two weeks ago. You see other people getting well and you say, well, this may work for me, you know, and you try it and it does and then you want to encourage other people to try it. Because, like I say, when, you've, when you reach the bottom, you go to grasping for straws. You sure do. You'll be willing to try anything. And it worked for me. It may not work for everybody, but I know it worked for me. All you lose is a little time. Isn't it worth trying it? I mean, what's your alternative? You're dying. You've been suffering for years. You're hurting. Try it, for Lord's sakes. We don't care if you believe it. We don't care if you're skeptical. But have your rear end sitting under that light trying it. Give it a chance. Be open-minded. We're collecting a, a lot of very good medical data. And, and I, it, I'm just so thrilled. And my best friend, he's still alive today. 16 years, been cancer-free since 1988 doing great, still the guinea pig for us. <laughs> but, uh, I mean, the proof is in the pudding. Uh, I can talk all day long about how great this is and how many hundreds and thousands of people it's helped over the last 16 years. But you need to get in front of it. See what it'll do for you. It may not do anything, but if you've been sent home and have no other hope for anything, give it a try. It's not gonna hurt you, it can only help.